77 and 6, would you continue with the description of your station keeping? the Titan II launch vehicle starting about 10 p.m. last evening. This was the operation took a little less than four hours. In the white room at Launch Complex 19, astronauts Edward White and Mike Collins, the backup pilots for the Gemini 7 mission, are in the spacecraft checking out various systems. Early this afternoon, they will be ready to report to the prime pilots, Frank Foreman and Jim Lovell, on the status of the Gemini 7 spacecraft. did comment that he was looking forward to a good long flight. Attending the breakfast with astronauts Borman and Lovell with Wally Shira and Tom Stafford, pilots for the Gemini 6 mission, which will be scheduled some nine days after the Gemini 7 liftoff. When I first heard of this plan to rendezvous two spacecraft by launching a second spacecraft from the same pad within nine days, I thought it was next to impossible. The prime pilots for the Gemini 7 mission, Frank Borman and Jim Lovell, have arrived at Mars Complex 19. They're in their lightweight suits. They have their helmets attached. Basically, this lightweight suit offers greater mobility and comfort for the crew, which will fly 14 days in space. However, it offers the same protection in any emergency as the standard suit. During the flight of Gemini 7, the crew will remove their lightweight spacesuit and fly in their underwear. T minus one minute and counting. In the launch vehicle, first stage engines will ignite and build up some 430,000 pounds of thrust. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one, zero, ignition. Engine start, we have a liftoff.
We had about 20 experiments to perform in the two weeks ahead, but we, of course, had to check our new suits out, and we did regular medical checkups with the surgeons on the ground. Gemini 7 is basically a medical mission. It's the culmination of our efforts to increase or double man's exposure to the space flight environment, ending with a 14-day manned space flight. There were three principal problems left following our four- and eight-day flights. These were the ability to sleep in a space flight environment. Uh, secondly, the response of the heart and blood vessels to the readaptation to the ground-based or 1G environment after being weightless. And lastly, the uh, reduction or decrease in the number of red blood cells that is observed following uh, space flight. We were continually interested in the status of Gemini 6, and I must say that Elliot C. and the people at MCC kept us very well informed. Uh, you can tell them that the pad preparation schedule is going very well. It's taken about nine weeks or 63 days of actual work to clean up the pad, erect the booster, make the spacecraft, and check out the systems. We studied the problems, we found solutions, we streamlined the work effort, and within a couple of days, the whole atmosphere improved. With the planned 14-day flight, this gave us some margin, and the whole plan now appeared practical. Day 7, Houston, Capcom. Good morning, Flight. How's breakfast going? Excellent. My compliments to the chef. How is the suit configuration working out? We heard some comments over Carnarvon. The suit configuration is working out very well. I'm out of the suit now. I got slightly cool last night while I was sleeping. However, I'm fine right now. Chimney Control here. During the next pass across the United States, the Gemini 7 crew will be given a go for a 61-1 flight. The 61 would be the start of the 61st revolution. The 1 refers to the Western Atlantic landing area, which is the prime landing area. The spacecraft is over the Caribbean, and Lovell is talking to Dr. Berry. Let's cut in there. Okay, could we have your sleep report? Roger. Both of us slept six to seven hours last night. Probably woke two or three times during the night. Do you think you're sleeping better now than you were the last couple of nights? The first night was pretty poor, as you can probably guess. But we both needed a good sleep the second night, and we've been sleeping that way every time. Very good. Hey, sir, then, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. This is Gemini 7. This is Houston Flight. How long have you been up there now? Let's see, it's 139 hours, 5 minutes, 14 and a half seconds. Okay, that's the lot. I feel like I was born up here. Uh, be advised that the cow's going very well at the Cape on Jiminy 6. <laughs> the crew's up and healthy and we're all ready to go. Gemini 7. Your go for 119-1. Thank you, man. The word from the Cape is, we are go. They are go aboard Gemini 7 as they make their silent sweeps around the world on their 111th revolution. The prime pilots for the Gemini 6 flight, Wally Sherrard and Tom Stafford, and are now on their way to Launch Complex 19 to board their spacecraft. The launch of Gemini 6 is scheduled at the beginning of the 118th revolution of Gemini 7. T minus 48 and all still going well with our Gemini 6 countdown here at Launch Complex 19. We've gone through a complete checklist once again and we are counting. Two to go. Go ahead, Flight. We will have ignition at zero and some three seconds after ignition the launch vehicle will lift off on the start of the Gemini 6 flight. We're cleared for takeoff. Roger, adios. Minus five. Four, three, two, one. Ignition. Shut down, Gemini 6. Your pressure is lowering slowly. Roger, Gemini 6, uh, monitor, take pressures. 
Lots of eyes and pressures down to about 32. All tanks are venting. Okay, no problem on these tanks? Negative. Okay, we're just sitting here breathing. This was a rough one for us. We'd been trained sufficiently, but this was different than any simulation we ever had. It did prove that man is still better programmed than any computer. Gemini 7, Houston. We were wondering if you saw the ignition at the Cape. We were in perfect position, but we never saw the ignition. We were waiting for the liftoff. Roger, apparently it was uh, on and off very quickly. We'll keep you informed. It was a great disappointment. We'd made two attempts to launch and still no liftoff. Let us know about the recycle as soon as you know. Will you please, Chris? Raj, uh, they're talking Wednesday at the moment, but nothing uh, final yet. Very good. Gemini 7, Houston, do you still read us? <laughs> Sorry to disturb your lunch, but we have a message here we think you'd be interested in. We're coming up on a special time here, about five seconds. Mark, you have just exceeded the world's manned space flight endurance record. Mr. Kraft wants to launch at 8.27 Eastern Standard Time. So some four seconds before that, we'll be looking for ignition. The spacecraft already is on internal power. All quiet on the communications at the present time. actual apogee altitude is 140 nautical miles. 
The required apogee altitude is 146 nautical miles. To correct this condition, the command pilot will perform a height adjustment maneuver at the end of the first orbit using his aft flying thrusters. Gemini 6, Houston, you're coming up on one minute to the burn. Mark. We're showing the burn on the ground. Mark, burn complete. Gemini 7 is now here in a 161 nautical mile circular orbit. Gemini 6 is now here 560 miles behind Gemini 7 in an orbit having an apogee of 146 nautical miles and a perigee of 87 nautical miles. In this present orbit, Gemini 6 would catch up with Gemini 7 in approximately two hours. To allow the rendezvous to occur as planned, the catch-up rate will be slowed by two maneuvers. The first maneuver will be at second apogee applied in a posigrade direction to raise the perigee to 117 nautical miles. Gemini 7, Houston. The six burn is in approximately 10 minutes. I'll be switching to six now and I probably won't be calling you back. All right, you understand, seven here. We cannot expect both spacecraft to be in the same, exactly the same orbital plane. Therefore, at two hours and 42 minutes after liftoff, Gemini 6 command pilot Wallace Shara will yaw his spacecraft to the south and execute a plane change maneuver that will place his spacecraft exactly in the same orbit with Gemini 7. Gemini 6, Hawaii, Capcom. How are you doing up there? Very good. Complete the plane change burn. No residuals. The fuel remaining is 75%. Okay. Both spacecraft are now in the same orbital plane. Gemini 6, for the second time, will apply thrust at apogee to circularize his orbit at 146 nautical miles and to also slow his catch-up rate. At this point in time, Gemini 6 will be 15 miles below Gemini 7 and 140 miles behind. By this point in time, Gemini 6 should be within radar contact of Gemini 7. Uh, 6 Hawaii, do you need anything else? Negative. We're just watching the sun come up. Uh, Roger, your cohort is doing real fine also. We haven't heard him for quite some time. I'll give him a call. Stand by. 7 Hawaii, Capcom. Fine Hawaii. Your cohort there would like to know if you've heard him call you. We heard him talking to Houston, but we can't hear him calling us. Why don't you give him one shout? Hello, Gemini 6, this is 7. How do you read? Hey, Joy, we can't read him. Okay, probably the next time around, you'll probably be reading them loud and clear. We're three hours, 52 minutes into this rendezvous mission, and at the present time, we show the spacecraft moving across the Indian Ocean. There's just over an hour to go now before America's two spacecraft with their four astronauts on board can't meet 180 miles up in darkness over the Pacific Ocean. At 11.25 local time, Gemini's six spacecraft began its circularization burn. That burn was completed on schedule. The crews also have completed successfully a radar lock-on test. And uh, say again the range. Range was 115.58. All systems are looking good, flight. I'll tell you, he's flat flying that thing. He's just as steady as can be. When the slant range distance between Gemini 6 and Gemini 7 has been reduced to approximately 32 nautical miles, 
Gemini 6 will initiate the first of a series of terminal phase maneuvers. These maneuvers are accomplished by the command pilot placing the nose of his spacecraft at his target, Gemini 7, and thrusting along the line of sight. There will be two mid-course correction maneuvers, probably here and here. These maneuvers will place him on a trajectory that will be slightly below and in front of Gemini 7. At this point, he will perform a velocity match or braking maneuver that will bring about rendezvous. When he has completely matched the velocity of Gemini 7, he will station keep for several orbits. However, he will not dock. Spacecraft 7 and 6 are now about 25 miles apart. And as Mr. Kraft just observed, we here on the ground have done all we can in the way of computations. It's up to the crew now. They're on their own. Hey, I think I've got it. Is that spacecraft seven? Negative. The two is serious or give me seven. Six and seven away. We'll be standing by if you have anything for us. Okay. I have point five four medical nine. Stand by to break. Break at point four eight nautical miles. Six hundred and sixty feet. Gemini 6 to 7 feet. 300 feet. We're directly below them. 180 feet. 120 feet. Holding 120 feet, Wally. Rendezvous is Ask them what their range is now. About 20 feet. Yeah, we're sitting up here playing bridge together. Air formation is seven. Everything is go here. Uh, Roger, congratulations. Excellent. Thank you. This is a lot of fun. Rendezvous and docking are most essential to complete the Apollo lunar mission. Now, on this mission with Gemini 7, we and 6 came within about a foot of Gemini 7. Shortly after that, Gemini 7 maintained station on us as well. But rendezvous and docking are feasible for manned crews. Gemini 7, this is 6. You can hold it in the yaw for just a little while. We try to get in real close and try to get all those close shots. CSQ, Gemini 6, go. Roger, we'd like for you to observe uh, 7 on this road procedure and let us know if you see any water coming out of 7. Oh, I see some now. Could that be the water boiler? Comes out in the crystal form? Right. You know you guys are becoming famous. For what, Mark? For rendezvous and doing all those good things. Yeah. After we completed the rendezvous maneuver, we maintained formation. Actually, we were station keeping for a period of about five and a half hours. Now, this included an in-plane fly-around maneuver and an out-of-plane fly-around maneuver. During this period of time, each of us controlled spacecraft six for approximately 50% of the maneuvers. We separated from Gemini seven at 6 p.m. Cape time. This was performed by a nine feet per second retrograde maneuver. We separated to a distance of approximately 20 miles and performed experiments for the next two orbits. Captain Chira. Good morning, Chris. You're doing great. Let's put it down on the elevator. Good show down there. Before long, we'll be on the boat. All right, we're in pulse mode and in re-entry attitude now. Uh, Roger. Then we'll drift off back again. We'll see you on the beach. Okay, Wally. 
Let's go to recovery. It was an excellent slash dance. And half an hour later, millions of television viewers watched as the captain brought his huge ship gently alongside. It was really a treat to come back aboard in style on number three elevator. To have the realization that to accomplish the lunar mission, we had to prove endurance, and we're still proving it now, and to affect rendezvous. Rendezvous is so important to bring our men back from the surface of the moon and back to the Earth, and I hope also to number three elevator. Meanwhile, Gemini 7 goes on, round and round the Earth, slowly clocking up its required 206 orbits. Frank, we're moving right along in this suit situation. I would like to get some more specific comments from you at this time. Roger, there's no question in our minds the only way to fire these things is without pressure suits. Do you have any additional comments regarding use of the suits during the full duration? I'm convinced we can run the whole works without suits. All we need is a suit for re-entry and emergency stored on board somewhere. Roger, we copy. We're 317 hours into the mission, only 13 hours and 35 minutes from retrofire tomorrow morning. The mission is drawing to an end. The uh, 76 series of missions was a very fitting climax to a successful year of Gemini flight. Gemini 4 explored extravehicular activity. It also was the start of our buildup of long duration missions and went four days. Gemini 5, in turn, went eight days. We'd been in the water about 10 minutes when we saw a, a Navy frogman's face in the right window. He plugged in his interphone and his first words were Merry Christmas. The recovery forces were quite fast, and I believe in about 26 minutes from splashdown, uh, we were on board the helicopter. The chief symptom, in fact, the only symptom which we noticed was the uh, heaviness of the legs, that's all. The 14-day mission has shown us that man indeed adapts to the spaceflight environment, and that his body does not show changes which increase with his increasing exposure to that environment. The additional data allows us to medically commit man to a lunar mission. As we go through these things, the year does sound to be uh, quite easy. Actually, there are a number of difficult problems that were encountered and were overcome. Uh, some of these required considerable ingenuity. The best example of this was actually the reaction to the difficulty we had in the October launch attempt of Gemini 6. We were able to come up with a new mission. We were able to cycle back into our operation faster than ever before and conducted this very rapid turnaround. This effort on the 76th mission is an example of the American spirit as it exists through the years and is ample evidence that it exists today. Their voyage will be a continuous reminder that the peaceful conquest of space is the only conquest in which modern man can proudly and profitably engage. In this struggle, all men are allies, and the only enemy is the hostile environment. The victory over the final enemy will belong not just to Americans, but to the whole world.